Hello everybody. Apologies that I can't be with you today um, to talk to you about the importance of being explicit, metadata for data reuse and preservation. Today's conference topic is the future of archaeological archives. So why, when as a sector we have become much more familiar with the term metadata over the past decade, have I decided to talk to you today about it? Well, yes, we have become much more familiar with metadata. The creation of metadata is gradually becoming part of standard practice in many organisations and digital archiving has increased dramatically. Last year, the number of archives submitted to the ADS doubled from the previous year. We also now have the wonderful Dig Digital Toolkit to help us create data management plans and put good data management into practice. But is the metadata we are currently creating helping us to achieve a fair data set? something that is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. When looking at the quality of the sum of the metadata held by the ADS, we could argue that the metadata we are currently creating is not truly helping our digital archives achieve their fullest public value. So I think now is a good time to remind ourselves what metadata is, why it is important and how being explicit when creating metadata is integral for effective data reuse and preservation and ultimately to leave a lasting legacy for future generations. So to begin, if someone is finding it hard to find or use your data, it is often because metadata is the missing part of the puzzle. But what does metadata even mean? You might have seen metadata defined as data about data which is catchy, but not very helpful, and also a bit off-putting to people who are new to or intimidated by technical language. But all metadata is, is documentation or information. It just happens to be in digital form, describing digital things. Digital documentation about your digital resource. It's your photo registers, your database's dictionary, or your relationship diagram to your database or just written information about your project or data creation process. It's the part of the digital archive that provides context and meaning. Which is why metadata is so important. At a very basic level, a description of your data can unlock what it is and how it can be reused. But it can also be the means by which users can understand where your data came from, why it was created in the first place, and whether it is of any further use to them. It provides the context for its initial and continued existence and fills in the gaps of information that the data by itself cannot fill. Much like this image of a random can cannot be used without its label. As without the label's information, the consumer doesn't know if the can contains something consumable or potentially poisonous. Now metadata can cover different types of information and different repositories and data management professionals have different ways of grouping the types of information that the term metadata can cover. But for the purposes of this talk, I've picked out three of the more common categories, administrative metadata, structural metadata, and descriptive metadata. You might also come across subcategories such as provenance and preservation metadata, but broadly speaking, the information required to manage, understand and provide access to data falls under these three headings. Administrative metadata covers all the information required to manage a resource for continued access. It is about managing and recording the process a digital object goes through throughout its life cycle, from planning for its creation through to, hopefully, its continued and ongoing reuse. It is the information necessary for trusting the data and to provide for its ongoing preservation. In terms of archaeology, a key part of administrative metadata is describing provenance, information about the project, research or investigation that led to the creation of the digital resource, including who was involved in the project, as well as who, if anyone, peer reviewed the final output. For site-based work, the description of where the project took place and when it happened and what exactly happened is important. And also why? What were the drivers for the research? Why was some data retained and other data discarded? The why can be vitally important in assessing a resource's trustworthiness. In those whys, we can understand any limitations of the data, as well as any inherent bias or reasons for one interpretation of the primary data over another. 
administrative metadata also compromises technical information and may include information about IPR rights and reproduction rights or other access requirements as well as audit trails or logs created by a management system and any persistent identifiers for the resource. Structural metadata describes the organisation of an archive's digital objects and the relationships between them. It shows whether an object is part of a wider collection or group of collections. For example, an article may be part of a volume, which is in turn part of a journal series and it is important that the ordering of articles within a volume are attained. It means that no object is orphaned or without wider context of its related objects. Structural metadata can also show the original structure in which an archive was deposited. This may be arranged around several phases of work done on one site. And structural metadata can also describe which objects were deposited together. It can therefore connect the digital results of different phases of work as well as different phases of deposition. Importantly, structural metadata also links the digital resource to any related documentation, as well as any related collections within or without the repository in which it resides. It can show the relationship between the digital object and the event that created it, or further resources that were created years after by future researchers, linking the original resource to its later reuse, which is important for demonstrating the impact of that resource. So with administrative metadata, we know where the resource came from and how it was made and how to manage it. With structural metadata, we may know it came from a collection of objects as part of a single deposition from a single event, and we can find related documentation. But what is it? Descriptive metadata can be a tricky one, especially for archivists or those trying to describe the data later. The longer the gap between the creation of an object and the longer the chain of people involved between the creator and the final point of access, the harder it is to describe. Descriptive metadata may also be subjective, where the content or narrative is dependent upon interpretation, which it is why it is important that methodologies are put in place to ensure that the correct people are creating the metadata at the correct points. It is the key metadata type for resource discovery as it describes the content of a resource and it is what most often connects the user to the objects they are interested in. It is what subject-based searches use to find data, the theme, the topic, the type of content. And while a picture may paint a thousand words, sometimes those words may not be the correct one or may be invisible to anyone less familiar with the subject matter. The former are those who are not capable of seeing visual media at all. It may be that at first the basic title of caption is the sole point of reference for some users. How we use descriptive metadata can be broken down by answering four basic questions based around what, where, who and when. What type of research is it and what is it about? Is the resource about a specific place? Where is that place? And is the resource about a specific person? What time period does the resource cover? And will it be of interest to users researching a particular historical period or event? So, starting with what is it? At the very basic level, there should be an informative title explaining what the resource is and what its content is. So again, especially for those who cannot recognise or access your visual media, including those who may rely on screen readers for their information, this should be a short textual caption which can be expanded upon with a separate description. These images are all of trenches, but actually there's nothing in the illustration that describes them as images, or even that there are five of them, or that they are photographs. To anyone who cannot view the photographs, they could be sketches, maps, or simply a list reading trench one, trench two, trench three, etc. To anyone unfamiliar with the wider context that these images are the result of modern archaeological fieldwork, for all anyone knows, they could refer to military or defensive trenches or building ditches. So here we have a good illustration of the title of this presentation, the importance of being explicit, and how this helps to provide access to people who may have physical or technological limitations that make online images impossible to view ensuring fair and wide reach to potential users. A simple description such as the one now shown makes all the difference. 
and removes the idea that this data is only for people who are already in the know. If the subject matter of the resource you are describing is about a specific location, or is location-based, then it is important to add that to any description. As I mentioned with the five trenches, without context, those trenches could be interpreted as building or military trenches. And to anyone except the creators, those trenches could have been located anywhere. In that case, Trench 1 was located in East Street, Olney, Milton Keynes, England, UK. And the creation location and the location as a subject of the photo itself were the same. But that is not always the case. Specialist research might be undertaken at a laboratory, for example, and all of the data created in the lab. But the research might be analysing items originating from an entirely different continent. Or it might be that a thesis written in the UK might be entirely to do with the migration in continental Africa. So the location as a descriptive metadata item should be treated as distinct from the location showing where the resource was created. Being explicit in these different cases makes it easier for the user to be aware of the difference between the place of origin and the primary material and the location and possible culture that it interprets. Place names are not self-evident. While an archivist may think a site is well famous, some people may or not have heard of it, or it may be known differently to other users around the world. Place names are also not unique. Only in Buckinghamshire, England, the site of one of those trench images, is only one of several Olneys in the world, 12 of which are in the United States. Place names also come and go. Countries, borders shift, places are renamed. Counties and states redefined. Sites and buildings demolished or destroyed. So the metadata should acknowledge if a place name is current, true at the point of data creation, or referring to a historical place. Then there are places that never existed except in myth or fiction, but still form the subject of a resource when depicted on artefacts or in text. A stone carving depicted Valhalla or Asgard from North Mythology would be an example of this. Where a resource is about a particular person or figure, it is important that users can find it based on their name or common identification. Things to consider when describing people for users are alternative names. Is a historical figure known by different names by different researchers? Roman Emperor Constantine I, shown here on a coin in the top right, was also known as Constantine the Great, or the object itself might refer to him by his Latin name Flavius Valerius Constantinus. It also might be worth distinguishing between people who are contemporary to the resource, a known person, historical figure, or a mythological one. If the person is still living, it may be that they are privacy issues, or simply specific names or titles by which they wish to be known, or referred to in different contexts, and that might change should their name or titles change. Would your users be likely to want some background information as well? Is a name not enough? If so, tied to a person's name, you might need to document key facts about their life or reasons for their identification or presence in your data or archive. The black and white photograph in the bottom image depicts archaeologist Alan Vince, and together with his data, the collection describes who he was and what his area of research was. And finally, the when. If a user comes to an archive looking for a 15th century shipwreck, then the only way they can find it is if the descriptive metadata is there to highlight it. As with location, the description of time when it comes to subject matter is distinct from the point in time which the resource was created. This is also true of digitised materials, a 21st century scan of a 16th century letter, for example. A letter's contents might also discuss an earlier or future period or date. So your descriptive metadata may need to have room for both the time period as discussed in the letter and the time period the digitised letter was written. Perhaps something to consider is that often in archaeology, the interpretation of the time period from which a feature or artefact originates is uncertain or subject to change as scientific methods of dating evolve. The description of an item's period of origin is therefore not necessarily fixed and it is an example of how a metadata record is a living record, not a static one.
When well constructed, metadata is powerful. You can use it to interrogate and present your data in different ways, but semantic metadata is even more powerful. So if metadata is data that describes data, semantic metadata describes the meaning of that data. And it does this in a way so that machines and not just humans can infer or interpret information about that metadata. For both machine and human understanding, it is essential that the terms you use are explicitly defined, whether internally in your own metadata or externally through the use of established vocabularies. One person's definition of the Iron Age, for example, is not the same as another's. So if you use that term, your audience should be able to find out what you mean by it. In terms of building trust in your data, it is important for users to know why you might have chosen to describe a digital object in a specific way, and if you are following a set of standards. While I mentioned that our administrative metadata can be useful to establish trust in the quality of the data itself, it is also important that our users, the future archaeologists, can trust the metadata we are using to describe it. Incorporating semantic technology, like using linked data heritage thesauri, for example, allows you to tap into metadata that is rich with meaning and context. And following a set of standards can be useful to create consistency in the format of your metadata. And of course, it allows for your data set to be linked to thousands of other datasets. This improves your datasets interoperability, the I in fair data. To visualize some of what I've just said, this is an example of a mapping tool which was designed by the Ariadne Plus project to help aid interoperability. It allows for the mapping of source vocabulary, such as the fish archeological objects thesaurus seen in this example, to be mapped to other vocabularies and even other languages. This mapping allows for different sectors and different languages to have their own vocabularies, which are interoperable with each other. So when searching for a fish term in a search portal, you would be able to find correct objects, even if they've been recorded in a different language. This can be seen to best advantage in the Ariadne portal, which brings together archeological records from around the world into one search facility. And by following standards, using vocabularies and mapping our metadata, ADS is able to share our data with a much wider group of users. Creating extended catalogues such as those seen in the Ariadne portal here, or in more closer to home, the UK's National Archives search facility. This all widens your reach, gives you a much larger potential user community and increases the value of your data. As this ADS archive example shows, because we have mapped our metadata to the National Archives and Ariadne, this archive can also be found in those search portals, increasing the findability of the original dataset. Now ADS, as specialist in digital preservation, we focus on keeping the data itself safe and accessible. But just to leave you with a thought on metadata as a lasting record taken from recent events, if disaster struck and the digital resources themselves needed to be taken offline or were somehow no longer available, what story would your metadata tell? What gaps could it fill? Would there be a record left at all? And I am sorry that I can't join you today, but if you do have any questions, please do send them in an email to help at archaeologydataservice.ac.uk and I'll be happy to pick them up and answer them for you. Thank you.